Hi there, my name is Matthew Leonardi, and I'm a gynecological surgeon and sinologist at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. Today's workshop is meant to focus on preserving fertility in women with gynecological pathology. Specifically, we're going to focus on endometriosis, and the goal was originally to focus on treating endometriosis, but I'm going to shift that a little bit more to the diagnosis of endometriosis because I believe everything starts at the diagnosis and choosing the correct treatment plans relies on the diagnosis of endometriosis. This is a very complex topic and by no means are we intending to get through the complexity of it today. I'm very happy to speak about this offline following this presentation. These are my disclosures. This is where I can be reached by email here, matthew.leonardi at sydney.edu.au. Alternatively, I encourage those of you who are on social media to connect with me there, or if you're not, please consider joining. Endometriosis is very common amongst those with female infertility. Women with infertility and partners who have normal sperm have been demonstrated to have endometriosis prevalence rates approaching 50%. Here we have a number of doors that are closed. And each of these doors is essentially a treatment option for infertility. Behind the doors are the outcomes of those treatment options. In gynecology, because there have been historically many limitations with respect to diagnosing pathology, there's been a lot of guessing, guessing which door is the right door for which patient. However, I believe if we improve our ability to diagnose patients, improve our knowledge before the time where you have to decide on treatment, we might be able to more specifically choose the treatment options and optimize the outcomes. For example, take a patient who has bilateral tubal blockage on a high cozy test and everything else looks normal and basic pelvic option. The uterus looks good, the ovaries look good, but there's tubal blockage. In this patient, you know, you might be heading towards IVF because they have bilateral tubal blockage. But would your management change if you knew that they had deep endometriosis in the posterior compartment in their uterus sacral ligaments or in their bowel? Would you consider going to do surgery for that patient even as a exclusive treatment and then allowing them to try to conceive naturally thereafter? Or potentially you might do surgery and then do IVF. The knowledge of the disease state allows for better options, uh, uh, choosing of options really. Take, for example, another patient who has entirely normal investigations on, uh, on their infertility workup. And, uh, and that does not include a diagnostic laparoscopy because uh, most of the time diagnostic laparoscopy is not done as a routine investigative tool. And in my fertility rotation, not once did I see a patient have a diagnostic laparoscopy in the context of unexplained infertility. So take this patient who has normal investigations, patent tubes, uh, and might you suggest that they first try to go for controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, or maybe they might go for IUI. They might not jump straight to IVF, but they might try some uh, less uh, serious assisted reproductive technologies. What if you knew from either imaging or diagnostic laparoscopy that this patient had superficial endometriosis? Would you still allow them to proceed with those treatment options? Or would again, you consider surgery followed by attempts at natural conception? The knowledge of the disease presence or absence and when present, the severity does allow for better decision-making of treatment options and hopefully thereafter optimizes outcomes. That's why I wanna focus on a few areas today that I think we can really improve our ability to detect endometriosis and then allow that to direct our interventions when it comes to infertility. The uterosacral ligaments are a uh, classically challenging uh, anatomic site to visualize, and we still have very poor diagnostic accuracy for uterosacral ligament endometriosis. So here on, uh, on these images, we have uterosacral ligament uh, on ultrasound. Here it is depicted by a hyperechoic band just adjacent to the vagina, which is hypoechoic. This is some fluid just sitting here in the pouch. And if you were to imagine uh, the, the position of the probe, it would be aligned with this uterosacral ligament here surgically. Uh, obviously, this is at laparoscopy when the abdomen is insufflated with uh, gas, uh, but in a collapsed pelvis, things would look a little bit different. This is normal and this is normal. Here we have a video of uterosacral ligament just here. Essentially, you put the probe in the posterior fornix of the vagina and you slowly move your hand to one side 
to visualize the patient's right heterocycle ligament, you do need a slight clockwise rotation of your hand. And the opposite is true. To visualize the patient's left uterosacral ligament, you need a slight anti or counterclockwise rotation of the hand. Here we have an abnormal uterosacral ligament with deep endometriosis as depicted by this hypoechoic nodule just here. You can also see in this video that the uterus is retroverted and there is a negative sliding sign with disease likely in the bowel here, although not the focus of this video. And so in this patient here, identifying this uterosacral endometriosis is very relevant because laparoscopically you may not be able to identify it due to the opaque nature of tissue. Knowing about this will allow one to better target therapies when it comes to infertility. For those that are interested in improving their ability to identify the uterosacral ligaments in a normal state, but also in an abnormal state, I highly recommend that you read this article that was prepared by myself and Professor George Condes. You can access the article by shining your camera at this QR code. Don't take a picture, just shine the camera at it. And at the top of your uh, screen, you should see a link pop up. If you click that link, it will take you directly to this open access article. The next to focus on is superficial endometriosis, which forever has been evasive in a non-invasive fashion, but there is evolving uh, literature in this area. Here we have uh, superficial endometriosis at laparoscopy. This has a very diverse array of appearances. And, uh, and so that makes it even more difficult to identify in a non-invasive fashion. But for those of you that are not surgeons, this is helpful to understand the various appearances of superficial endometriosis. These various lesions here. This is an ultrasound clip of superficial endometriosis along the peritoneum, just behind the cervix and the posterior vaginal fornix, this small area here, the hyperechoic focus that's moving. This is the exact depiction at laparoscopy. Here we have a still image of superficial endometriosis on ultrasound as depicted by this hypochoic area here and a hyperechoic focus here. And you can see here there's a peritoneal pocket uh, with some superficial uh, endometriosis as well. Peritoneal pockets are often due to endometriosis presence. So for those of you that are interested in improving your ability to visualize superficial endometriosis on ultrasound, I highly recommend that you review this article that was prepared by myself and a team of co-investigators. We have identified that we can visualize superficial endometriosis on ultrasound with a quite good diagnostic accuracy. And this will, uh, I think, continue to improve with time. So here's where you can access that article. This is kind of what I imagine our, uh, our scenario right now with respect to the treatment options for endometriosis related infertility. They're quite a disaster. Uh, there are no studies that compare assisted reproductive technologies with surgery. Uh, there are studies that are done under the silo of surgical treatment. They're done by surgeons who have an implicit bias in demonstrating the surgical efficacy. There are studies that are done under the silo of fertility therapy, and those are done by usually reproductive endocrinologists and fertility specialists, again, hopeful to depict the efficacy of their treatments for endometriosis-related infertility. There are two studies that I will uh, just briefly point you towards. This is a study a network meta-analysis that looked at interventions for endometriosis-related infertility. And as you can see from this node diagram here, they have included several medical therapies and surgical therapies, but no assisted reproductive technologies. And this is the uh, forest plot depicting that uh, lipidol and uh, surgery plus pentoxiflene may have some efficacy at improving fertility. I'll also point you towards an article that I have prepared with a large team of co-investigators where we wanted to assess the efficacy and safety of laparoscopic surgery for those with infertility due to endo, as well as those with endo who might desire future fertility. Now here's the QR code for that article. This was a very complex study, but essentially the evidence in this study, as well as that by Ruth Hodgson, uh, is inadequate overall. Uh, there are too few RCTs. The risk of bias in many of these studies is high. And it is very difficult to make very definitive arguments for surgery or fertility therapies based on these studies. So um, essentially, more research needs to be done and more direct head-to-head -head comparisons with surgical, medical, and assisted reproductive technology um, uh, uh, management strategies needs to be done. 
I'll leave you with, uh, with my contact information to discuss things further. And again, I'd like to thank Isua for the opportunity to present. And um, I hope that this has been helpful.